Chapter five, race for life. Brief rose. Like a giant wave of the sea, fear for her family washed over her. In that awful moment, Brie could only feel glad that she was home. Then with surprise, she found that her feet would move after all. As she raced for the house, Devin ran from the barn. They met at the kitchen door. When Devin jerked it open, Brie put her hand on his arm. We can't frighten them. Devin took a deep breath and stepped inside. Brie followed him. Kara and Jen sat at the kitchen table eating bread smeared with honey. Already, Mam was helping Granny onto a small cart that would carry her into the forest. It's time for the game, Mam told the little girls. Her quiet voice surrounded all of them with her love. Going along now, darlings. Mam's careful smile took in Devon, then lingered on Bree. Suddenly, Mam stopped what she was doing, hurried over and hugged Bree. The Lord keep you, she said quickly. Then Adam is outside. Bree snatched up a towel and tied two loaves of bread inside its corners. Taking Jen's hand, Bree led her to the door. First one to the boat wins, she exclaimed, starting the game. But then Bree turned, darted back, and planted a kiss on her mother's cheek. Love you, ma'am, she said. Love you always. Tears filled her mother's eyes. Love you forever, Bree. Outside, Devon had found Adam, but the seven-year-old was being stubborn. Take the girls, Pre told her older brother. With one in each arm, he headed for the river. Adam, come, Bree said, you must obey. Don't feel like it, I'm tired. Bree stopped and took a good look at him. Reaching down, she felt his forehead, a fever. But we've started our game, Bree held out her hand. If you hurry, I'll give you a prize when we get to the boat. Fighting for time, Bree pulled Adam along the path and through the gate to the river. By the time they reached Devon, he had the little girl sitting on the bottom of the boat. Adam again dug in his heels. Now he was unwilling to get in the boat. Tossing the bread at Devon, Bree picked up Adam. Angry now, he kicked her shins. Devon grabbed the boy's feet and Bree set him inside the boat. A moment later, Devon pushed off. I don't want to go, Adam complained. Quiet now, Bree said. Your voices carry over the water. I don't care. Part of the game is to be quiet, Bree told him. I want ma'am, Adam answered. I want daddy. Hush now. Frantically, Bree untied the towel, tore off a piece of bread, and thrust it into Adam's hand. That upset the girls. He didn't win, Jen complained, wanting the special treatment Bree had promised. You're right. Sorry, Jen. Bree passed the girls chunks of bread, picked up her oar, and thrust it into the water. But what's my prize, Kara asked. You said first one to the boat wins. Bree rolled her eyes at Devon. Dropping his oar, he dug deep into the pocket and pulled out two small smooth stones. With a wink at Bree, he gave one stone to each girl. Bree sighed. With long sweeps of the oars, she and Devon sent the boat skimming across the water. As they turned the rowboat, rowboat upriver, the bell from the monastery downstream started ringing again. For as long as Brie could remember, that bell had called her family to worship. From the time she was a little girl, Brie had loved going to church. Now the bell brought fear to her heart. Again and again it sounded, always with the same pattern of ringing. Brie and Devon bent to the oars, rowing their fastest. Partway through the signal, the ringing suddenly stopped. Brie turned to Devon and met his gaze. There, there, she whispered not just at the sea, not just spotted from the high tower, not just coming up the river or through the forest. The Vikings were at the monastery. This was not something Bree had imagined. It was real. Let's pray, Devon said. Without pausing in her rowing, Bree nodded. She prayed harder than she had ever prayed in her life. For the monk ringing the bell, the students from many lands, the monks scattered across the monastery, and most of all, for Brother Cronin. Do you think they're all in the tower, Brie asked after a time? They would have gone there the first ring. They'll be safe. In her mind, Brie could imagine them, the students and the monks hurrying up the ladder to the opening 13 feet above the ground, men pulling up the ladder, slamming the door, and dropping the timber bar in its place. The tower was the safest place the monks and students could be. All three children were quiet now, but Adam's eyelids were heavy his face flushed with fever. Brie felt his forehead again. 
Quiet down, she whispered, and stopped rowing long enough to settle Adam in the bottom of the boat. As she started to row again, Bree saw a thick cloud of smoke rising above the trees. She remembered the churches in the area, stone walls, stone roofs. She thought about the monastery school, wood. Bree's heart sank down to her toes. And what about the houses inside the walls and small huts where the monks prayed? The walls were woven together, branches, twigs, and clay. But the roofs? Straw thatch. Again, Bree remembered the tower and felt grateful for the place of safety. With relief, she thought about the three foot thick stone walls. The moment they reached their landing place, Devon remembered the churches in that area. The moment they reached their landing place, Devon caught rock and held the boat for Bree to leap out. Take them to the shelter, he whispered. I'll hide the boat and circle up the mountain, then back to where you are. When Devon set Kara on the landing rock, she stuck a thumb in her mouth. Eyes wide, the little girl knew without being told that this was no game. Jen was next. As Kara took her hand, the three-year-old started sniffling. Shh. But Jen began to wail, catching the little girl in her arms. Bree held her close to her chest. With Jen still sobbing and Kara's hand in her, hers, Bree started up the side of the mountain. When Adam refused to follow, Devon had no choice but to tie up, lift Adam from the boat, and carry him. The way was steep, the rocks more slippery than Bree had ever known. A difficult climb even when alone. Bree had all she could do to carry one girl and hang on to the other. Once some loose pebbles threatened to send them all into the river. Once Bree stopped to quiet Jen again. And once Bree lost her breath and wondered if she could keep on. With each step upward, she pushed, her, pushed herself more. With every sharp turn, she glanced back down the slope. Devin was strong and climbed as fast as he could. But Adam hung heavy on his shoulders. In the forest beneath the steepest part of the mountain, Bree looked for the markers as Devin had taught her. When they finally reached the shelter, Bree pushed the girls inside and crawled in behind. Devin followed with Adam. Exhausted by the race against time, Bree and Devin drew long, ragged breaths. We're here, Bree made her voice bright and forced herself to smile. Now we get to play another game. We'll pretend that we live here. I'll take care of the boat, Seven. Devon said quietly, but Adam clung to his brother's neck. I want to go with you. Devon shook his head. You stay with Bree. I'll be right back. I don't want to stay with Bree, Adam answered. When Devon tried to unwrap his arms, the boy tightened his hold. I'm staying with you. His blue eyes were dark with worry. Devon sighed. Once Adam made up his mind, neither Devon nor Bree could change it without a big quarrel. Or still, every second counted. I'll go. Bree edged toward the opening of the shelter, then remembered one of Devon's special gifts. Tell us a story, she said. In the dim of the hideaway, Devon sat down and leaned against the containers of food. With Adam still in his arms, the one little girl on either side, he began spinning a new tale. At once, the children were caught up in a story. The cold, frightening feeling left at the pit in Bree's stomach. Even Jen giggled at his imaginary child who danced her way across a bog. Bree slipped out of the shelter. Half walking, half sliding, she made her way down the mountainside. When she reached the river, she yanked the rope free and scrambled into the boat. She was still breath, out of breath when she sat down, facing downstream. Dipping the oars silently, she headed up the river, rowing with the rhythm of long practice. With every moment, her worry about the time she had lost grew bigger. The smoke above the trees seemed closer now. Had the wind blown it their way? Or were the Vikings spreading out? Frantically, Bree searched for the place Devon had chosen to hide the boat. Turning often, Bree kept looking over her shoulder. Had I passed the rocks? In her fear, every threat grew big, every moment large with worry. Telling herself not to panic, Bree rode desperately, but everything looked different from the evening before. Then she understood why that was. This time, the Vikings are here. My brother Dev is not. When at last Bree spotted the opening between the rocks, she slipped the boat into the hiding place. Leaping out, she caught the rope and twisted it around the stick Devon had pushed into the riverbanks. Bree was partway up the steep hill next to the river when she heard a noise from downstream. The sound came from somewhere in the pine trees. Whoever it was, they were too far away. 
for Bree to understand what they said. But then she looked down the slope toward the rowboat, still held by the rope, but had slipped out from the rocks to drift in the current. Bree stared at the boat. I didn't tie it tight enough. The boat would give her away. If the men were, weren't expecting someone before, they would now, but there was no time for Bree to go back. Like a rabbit fleeing for cover, she scrambled up the steep slope. When she reached an opening in the trees, she again looked back. Devin had made sure they'd hide the boat in the same side of the river as the shelter. If there wasn't someone nearby, it would be simple to climb away from the water, loop around in the wooded part of the mountain, and drop down to the shelter. But now Bree had only one thought. I can't lead them to Dev and the others. Instead, she turned another direction. Ahead of Bree, the mountain grew even steeper. Climbing higher and higher, she finally paused to catch her breath. Even now, she could hear voices, two of them this time, then a muffled sound quickly silenced. Frantic to outrun whoever it was, Bree stopped her upward flight and headed sideways across the mountain. As the trees thinned out, she thought only about putting distance between herself and whoever followed. When she reached open ground, Bree started across the barren slope. Soon she'd find a hidden hiding place. All would be well. Then she glanced down the slope. Bree noticed the dress she had worn to school, bright blue cloth. Bree groaned. She had always liked the dress because it seemed to sparkle like a jewel. Now she knew it would be the worst possible co color. Dropping under her stomach, she rolled over several times. But when she stood up again, she knew the blue cloth would never blend with gray rocks and light brown earth. In that moment, Bree realized her mistake. In her panic, she had outrun the cover of trees. If she went back, she'd lead anyone who followed to the place where her brothers and sisters hid. Ahead lay a thundering waterfall and heights too dangerous to climb, but not far away. Across the open slope was a large rock. If she could lie down behind it. Bree broke into a run. Halfway to the rock, she looked back. Far below, two men came out of the trees along the river. With one glance, Bree saw the helmets and shields, the knee breeches with leather straps around the legs. Bree had no doubt who they were. Vikings! Don't attract attention, she told herself. Slowly, Bree lowered herself to the ground, flat against the earth. She turned her head toward the river. Still alone, she lay, hoping the men would pass by without seeing her. They were almost beyond Bree when one of them turned. Looking up, he pointed toward Bree. Her heart skittered down to her toes. Oh, Father, she breathed silently. Never in her life had Bree been so afraid. Father in heaven, please help me. But the two men started her way. Bree had no doubt that they had seen her. I can't go back. I can't go forward. What can I do? And Bree knew the only direction she could go was up. Leaping to her feet, she started climbing again, but the way was steep. More than once, she nearly lost her footing on a slippery rock. Reaching out, she clutched a clump of heather. Still loose stones rattled down the mountain behind her. Bree stopped caught her breath. If she fell in this open slope, she would start rolling, sliding. Bree didn't want to think about it. Instead, she looked up to the mountain. Beyond that, she could hurry downhill. If she got that far, she would get away. Below Bree, the two men moved quickly, taking the steep slope as though they climbed mountains every day. Even more frightening, they talked and laughed as they climbed. No doubt about it, they knew they had Bree cornered. Step by careful step, she moved upward. Wherever a small bush grew out of the mountainside, she grabbed hold and pulled herself up. At a call from below, Bree turned. The men were gaining on her. Fear knotted her stomach. Bree again searched for handholds. As she reached the last bush on the slope, she heard a cruel laugh. Anger flashed through Bree. What right had they, these lawless Vikings, these robbers, these pirates, to enter her land, to bring terror and danger to everyone in their path, to climb this mountain, hunting her down. Desperately, Bree pushed herself on, taking one careful step after another. But the men were gaining on her. With each moment, Bree grew more afraid. Closer and closer, the men climbed. Filled with panic, Bree forgot to be careful. Suddenly, small loose stones slipped out from beneath her. Arms waving, she tried to catch her balance. Instead, 
She crashed down, slamming into the ground. For a moment, she lay there. In the next instant, she started to slide faster and faster. The dirt and stones poured down the slope, carrying Bree towards the river. Chapter six, Dragon in the Night. Reaching out, Bree tried to grab anything she could. Instead, the slide picked up speed, gathering more soil and loose stones. As a cloud of dirt rose around her, Bree gave up hope that she could stop. She only managed to raise her arms and protect her head. Then, just as suddenly as it began, the ground stopped moving. Covered with dirt that filled her mouth and nose, Bree lay there, unable to move. My legs, she thought, what? Wrong with my legs? A rough hand grabbed her arm, pulled at it. Stop it, Bree cried. With her free hand, she tried to wipe the specks of dirt from her eyes. Instead, she made everything worse. Blinking, she struggled to see. Only then did she realize that her legs lay under a mound of dirt and small stones. Digging with their hands, the men pushed the dirt aside. Though Bree still wondered if she could move, one of them jerked her arm and pulled her up. Through the grit in her eyes, Bree looked from one to the other. Her captors were not men, but lads about her age. When one of them pointed toward the river, Bree knew he intended her to walk the rest of the way down the slopes. She also knew she had no choice but to start. To Bree's relief, her legs worked. As she stumbled down the mountainside, her thoughts scurried every which way, then settled on a frantic prayer. Jesus, protect me, Jesus. Over and over, Bree, Bree prayed his name. One question pounded away at her mind. How can I escape? But the lads walked close behind her. When she tried to run, one of them grabbed Bree's arm and held up a fist. When she pretended that she couldn't keep up, the other pushed her ahead. And when Bree reached the bank of the river, the taller of the two lads took a rope made from walrus hide and tied her wrists together. Pointing downstream, he made it clear that she should start walking again. For as long as she could remember, Bree had played in this forest. In spite of her fear, she knew exactly where she was. And now as they walked, her captor shoved her toward the O'Toole farm, when Bree saw where they were headed, her dread grew. If somehow the Vikings missed her family's farm on their way upriver, they could happen upon it now. As much as Bree wanted to break free and run home, she couldn't let them find her mother and grandmother. When Bree and the Vikings drew close to the building, she grew frantic. How could she change where they were going? Stumbling as if she had lost her balance, Bree fell to the ground. With her hands tied, she had trouble getting back on her feet. One of the lads yanked her arm and pulled her up. Setting out once more, Bree again walked ahead of them, but now she knew what to do. Changing direction gradually, she swerved away from the farm. After what seemed forever, she led the boys beyond the buildings in the place where Mam and Granny hid. For an instant, Bree felt relieved. The next moment, she felt like crying. Will I ever see my family again? Only yesterday, Bree had longed to visit new places. Now she wanted nothing else but to be safe and home, to be safe, to hug her parents and feel their arms wrapped around her. As Bree and her captives, captors walked, one string joined another, and then they followed the Avonmore River. The mists of Ireland fell upon them. Then the skies opened up and Bree was soon wet to her skin. But when night came, it was even worse for the darkness settled into Bree's spirit. One moment she felt that what was happening couldn't be true. The next moment, she knew that it was. Like a bird beating its wings against a cage, Bree only wanted to be free. After the longest walk in her life, she and the lads who had captured her reached the other Vikings. The pirates from the north had brought their longship partway up the Avonmore River. At the front of the ship, a great dragon head rose high in the air. Blacker than the night sky, its fierce open mouth seemed ready to spit fire. The sight of the dragon brought fresh terror to Bree. With one look at the fierce head, she tried to run. Her captors stopped her. Strong looking men with broad shoulders stood along the riverbank, facing away from the ship. When one of them spoke to the lads with Bree, she guessed that the men had been waiting to sail. The two boys gave Bree no choice but to climb aboard. There they tied up a rope around her ankles, leaving only a short length of line between her feet. Using a longer rope, they tied her to the side of the ship. Bree wasn't going anywhere 
The Vikings didn't want her to go. With the final shove, one of the boys pushed her into the crowded end of the boat. With her hands tied, Bree couldn't catch herself. Falling under the deck, she lay there, too weary to move. Though used to climbing steep places, Bree's flight up the side of the mountain had left her muscles aching and sore. The walk of the many miles had bought, brought blisters to her feet. But worse still was the way Bree felt on the inside. Lying on the deck, she lay there, too weary to move. Though used to climbing, oh, she and Devon, her entire family, had tried to outwit the Vikings. In spite of their best efforts, she had failed. What happened to the rest of my family? To Dev and Adam, Kara and Jen, to Daddy, Ma'am and Granny. Brie looked around. By the light of the moon, she saw people of all ages. Only the old and the very young had been left behind. Scattered among them were girls and boys Brie's age or younger. Here and there, a child was weeping. Others huddled together to stay warm. Still others worked at their ropes, trying to get free. Men and older boys had their hands tied behind their back. Women, girls, and younger boys had their wrists tied in front of them. Brie was one of those and felt glad that she could still use her hands for some things. Like Brie, the other Irish were tied to the ship so they couldn't jump overboard. Like Brie, the other Irish were tied to the ship so they couldn't jump overboard and try to swim to freedom. Brie felt sure that the prisoners would become slaves working for those who had captured them. At best, someone would pay a great amount of money to ransom them. Then Brie felt the ship move out from shore. As it reached the river channel, she heard the creak of oars. With her tied together hands, she pushed herself onto her knees to see over the side of the boat. Peering into the night, Brie looked for markers, the rocks and trees she knew like special friends. Then the overhanging branches of tall oaks met like an arch above them, and darkness hid almost everything. Even so, Brie felt knelt on the deck, watching for a way to escape. A knot of fear gathered in her chest and slid down to her stomach. As they sailed beyond the trees, the moon lit their way. The men who were rowing sat on wooden chests along both sides of the longship. Their long oars extended out through specially made holes in the side of the boat. Working as one, the men moved forward, back, forward, back in steady rhythm. Bree knew when the river widened and the Viking ship slipped past the cottages at Arklow. As they entered the sea, she felt the breeze of open water on her face. The men put down their oars, set a mast in the center of the ship, and ran up a sail. As the moon climbed higher, Bree watched the large piece of cloth catch the wind. Billowing out midway in the ship, the square sail was a thing of beauty, but Bree had no liking to where it was taking her. She also had no doubt about where they were going, one of those terrible northern countries where Vikings lived. For the first time, Brie did not feel excited about traveling to lands beyond the Irish Sea. Instead, she wanted to live in the green hills of Ireland forever. Still watching for markers along the sea coast, Brie saw the stony beach near Wicklow Town. Soon they passed the huts of fishermen with their boats pulled up on shore. Beyond that came a great length of sandy beach. And finally, miles up the coast, Brie recognized a headland, a cliff or Brie. Darker than the night sky, it towered above the sea. If Dev could see me now, she thought. Stubborn, he thinks, like the name he gave me, a mountain that can't be moved. But Bree knew better. With fear grabbing her inside, she wondered, can I be as strong as a mountain? Bree felt sure she couldn't. Now if she were dead, if she had his courage. The thought made Bree lonesome for home and the older brother who often teased her but always watched out for her. For one of the few times in her life, she wished Devin could take care of her. Around Bree, the younger children had curled up wherever the length of rope allowed them to settle. Some lay with eyes closed and some seemed sound asleep. Often others wept softly. Is this terrible ship real? Bree wondered. Have I really been stolen away by the Vikings? Maybe I'll wake up and find it's all a nightmare. nightmare. By now, Bree's legs and feet prickled with a thousand needles. With their tied together hands, she rubbed hard, trying to get her circulation back. It wasn't enough. Awkward now and miserable besides, she pushed herself onto her feet. Halfway up, she fell with a thud. Angry tears blurred her eyes. Then Brie remembered, was it only yesterday that she crept out of the house before dawn? Had she really stood on Brockage Mountain, wanting to see new lands? Had, if she had only known how she would travel. Brie's cheer, tears changed to nervous giggles. 
Then she giggled, just imagining how she must look. Her lovely blue dress covered with dirt, smudges of dirt all over her face, dirt changing the color of her reddish blonde hair. Dev would find something funny even in this. Look at the Colleen, he'd say. Look at how beautiful she is. Dev, I need you here. You always manage to take care of me, except now when it counts the most. In that instant, Brie felt angry, angry at the Vikings, angry at the way they took her from everyone and everything she loved. Angry at how they had treated her, tied her arms and feet, angry that they had changed her life forever. Like a fire out of control, Bree's anger tore through her entire being. She wanted to strike out at everything in sight, every rope, every cruel Viking, every plank upon the ship. I want to go home. I want to be with my family. I want to grow up in Ireland and someday marry an Irish lad. Worst of all was Bree's fear. Again, she wondered what would happen to her parents, to Granny, Dev, Adam, Kara, and Jen. Terror squeezed Bree's heart. What will happen to me? For the 100th time she asked herself, will I ever see my family again? Around Bree, the night air was broken by people lying awake or stirring in their sleep. From somewhere near the front of the boat, Bree heard a cough. It sounds like Dev, she thought, then pushed the idea away. She could only hope that he was safe. One by one, Bree's tears slid down her cheeks. Each time she brushed them away with their tied hands, they were, there were more. Then, like a mighty wave, sobs welled up inside her. Bree tried to swallow them to muffle the sound so the oarsman sitting in the nearby sea chest could not hear her. Instead, her shoulder shook with sobbing. Suddenly, a Viking stretched out his foot and kicked her. Bree gasped. His second kick was even more painful. Bree clapped her hand over her mouth to keep from crying out. Like a white hot flame, her anger flared. Bree glared at the man, then hoped he couldn't see. From the darkness came his cruel laugh. No doubt about it, he knew how she felt. That only made things worse. Bree clenched her fists until her fingernails bit into the palms of her hands. Taking a deep breath, she made a promise to herself. From now on, I will not show my anger and hurt. I will not show any feeling that makes them think they're winning. As though he could hear Bree's thoughts, the man laughed again. The evil sound set shivers down her spine. Forcing herself to be still, Bree lay down, but her thoughts raced ahead of the wind that filled the sail. How will I ever hide my feelings? How can I keep them from knowing how upset I am, how much I hurt, how much I hate them? Closing her eyes, Bree remembered home, her mother's good cooking, Jen and Kara, and the feel of their mother's arm around her neck. She remembered lambs playing in the green meadow. She thought of the tall trees near the cottage with the fat straw roof. Just the same, her tears returned. On her knees again, Brie covered her mouth with her hands and sobbed into the boards of the deck. This time, no sound escaped her lips. At last, exhausted from weeping, Brie finally lay still. The night wind was cold, her dress was still wet, and she had no cloak to cover her. There in the dark, surrounded by prisoners who were afraid to talk, Brie thought of Brother Cronin. The kind monk seemed at least a hundred years away, but Brie remembered his words. When he helped her learn the Holy Scripture, she said, when you have a hard time, call up the verses you've memorized. Repeat them in your mind. And Daddy, was it only yesterday that he reminded her of God's special gift, his word in her heart? Whatever you face, if you ask God to help you, he will, Daddy had said. Now Bree knew just the thought she needed, a verse from the fourth Psalm. For the first time, she wondered about the shepherd boy who wrote the words. What was it like to guard sheep in the fields at night to keep wild animals away. To Bree, the Vikings seemed like wild animals. The boy David seemed even farther away than Cronin. But Bree knew David's words, I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. Dwell, thought Bree, live in that place. Turning her head, she looked up, but clouds covered the moon. No shelter above, only the Viking sail that was taking her farther and farther from home. Again, Dree, Bree took a deep breath. You alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. Still repeating the verse to herself, Bree started to drift off. Then she heard the sound of weeping not far away. Raising her head, Bree listened. The weeping came from just beyond where she lay. Her elbows on the deck, Bree pulled herself that way. The rope binding her ankles dug into her skin. 
The rope that tied her to the ship help, held her back. But when she could go no further, Bree managed to bump her head against the foot of a young girl. Instantly, the child grew silent. Jesus is with you, Bree whispered, speaking in the Irish. In the darkness, she felt movement. The child trying to come closer? Again, Bree whispered, though you cannot see him, Jesus is with you. The child's back was turned, but Bree heard the quick intake of breath, a shuddering gasp, but then silence. Though it's dark, Jesus is light, Bree promised. He knows you. He loves you. Pushing her feet and elbows against the deck of the ship, the child managed to turn toward Bree. The small hands of a girl, wrists bound together with rope, reached toward her. Brie could hardly touch them with her own bound hands. Laying her hands on top of the cold fingers, Brie whispered again, Jesus is with you. Go to sleep. Quickly, Brie began to hum. So soft was her voice that no one else stirred. Before long, Brie felt the small fingers relax. She heard a ragged sigh and the child's even breathing. Brie felt glad. Strange, she thought, it helped me to help her. For a long time, Brie lay without moving, staring up into the darkness. For you, O oh lone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety, and this small child too. Then Brie fell asleep. Sometime during the night, she felt dimly aware of the boat bumping against a shore. Opening her eyes, she raised her head, then sat up. In the moonlight, she saw two men come on board. Walking one behind the other, they carried something, something between them. A blanket? Yes, that's what it was, a blanket stretched between across two long poles. Once before, Brie had seen someone carried that way. What was it, what was it called, a stretcher? Carefully setting their feet between the people lying on the deck, the two men passed close. As they came near Brie, one of them stumbled over a prisoner. The man on the stretcher raised his head. For a brief moment, Brie saw his gray-white hair and flowing beard. Then as though they were very weak, the man dropped back on the stretcher. The men carrying him moved to the front of the ship. Soon, Brie heard angry voices. Straining to hear, she could barely make out a few words. Whatever was wrong, it seemed terribly important. Then the long ship slipped back into the water. The dipping oars blurred the voices and Brie felt the up and down rhythm of the waves. As she drifted back to sleep, she heard someone coughing. Again, the sound came from the other side of the large sail. Again, it sounded familiar. Rising up on her elbows, Brie tried to see beyond the sail to the front of the boat, but the darkness and the people hid her way. Strangely, the cough made her lonesome for her brother, Devin. It's the way he coughs when he's nervous. Half awake, half asleep, Brie pushed the thought aside. I'm so lonesome for home, I'm just imagining things. Oh, it worked. 